All right, everyone, I'm showing that it's seven o'clock. So um, let me get things started here. My name is Janet Townsend. On behalf of the Champaign County Master Gardeners Program Committee, I'd like to welcome everyone who has signed in with us tonight um, and thank them for joining us. I wanna mention that at the end of the program, there will be a pop-up survey that will show on your screen. So don't be in a big rush to sign off at the end. We'd appreciate it if you'd just take a few minutes to fill that survey out for us and submit it. Um, our speaker tonight is Chris Inroth. Chris is the horticulture extension educator for Henderson, Knox, McDonough, and Warren counties in Illinois. Chris received his bachelor's of landscape horticulture from Southern Illinois University Carbondale and earned his master's of landscape architecture at Kansas State University. When Chris isn't busy at work, he enjoys spending time with his wife, Amy, and their three young sons, Ben, Eli, and Jonah. And now it is my pleasure to present Chris Inroth. Well, thank you very much, Janet. Uh, I'm happy to be here tonight. And just in case anyone uh, hears it, I am presenting from home tonight. So if you do happen to hear my lovely wife yelling at my three wonderful small children, just know that's just life. Uh, in my household. So <laughs> just uh, in case you hear that or the dog bark, uh, all things that could happen at any second here. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about xeriscaping and Janet, I don't know if you or Tabitha were the geniuses behind this, but it is actually World Water Day. Um, this is an actual day where we celebrate or not really celebrate, but we recognize the fact that there are over 2 billion people on this planet that do not have access to clean safe drinking water. And so it, it calls to mind where, where we need to, uh, I would say, celebrate the fact that we do have clean, safe drinking water in most parts of the United States here, but that we also need to be responsible with our use of that water. So um, that is really the point of the presentation today. Um, we are in Illinois, and so that means we often get ample rainfall. We are usually pretty good in terms of the annual rainfall events. But there are always those years where we have droughts, where it's dry and hot. Um, and there are definitely years, and I might be calling to mind um, in the past, the year of 2012, uh, my first year as a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension. And it was one of the most severe droughts that we have seen in Illinois in a long time. In my part of the state in west central Illinois there were water restrictions where there were small towns that were running out of water and so people could not be watering their gardens they could not be washing cars or things like that so um, it was really really a, a, a significant event and something that while we don't have to often think about here in Illinois there are other places in the country out further west namely that they do have to consider things like water restrictions and drought and Eventually, who knows, maybe we'll have to encounter this once again here in Illinois. So let's get started with another look at a history lesson. So in the term xeriscaping, where it comes from. So it, it really comes back to Colorado, 1976 and 77. That winter, there was a severe drought. It basically brought the entire economy um, uh, to a screeching halt. Now, what are the most vital things to the Colorado economy? Well, as you can see here indicated on this picture, it's obviously going to be snowfall because who uses that snow? Well, it would just so happen to be the tourists. So the tourism industry is huge for Colorado. But what is the second biggest industry in Colorado? It's agriculture. Now, Colorado, if you've ever been there, and I have been there, it can be pretty dry in a lot of places. It's a massive rain shadow when you get across those Rocky Mountains there. And so there is a, a, a lack of annual rainfall that occurs you know, throughout the entire year. A lot of it comes during the winter months. It blankets those slopes. And that water melts, it runs off, refills the reservoirs, and farmers can use that water to help irrigate crops. 
that unfortunately did not happen in that summer of 76 and 77. Um, the snows never arrived. And that next summer saw incredible water shortages and restrictions. So the governor at that time, his name was Richard Lamb. He said, we need to do something so that if, if this ever happens again, we are going to be better prepared because people's landscapes and gardens, they were drying up, they were dying, wanted to know what they could do to ease the burden so that there would be more water available if this emergency ever happened again for recreation and ag-based industries. So in 1978, the Denver Water Department, they had this idea. They convened a group of experts in all different fields, and they came up with this idea that they called xeriscaping. And that's kind of back to where we started here. What is xeriscaping? Well, if one would think about the actual meaning of this term, uh, xeros, uh, which is Greek for dry, and scape for vista, it might invoke some type of an image such as this, a sun bleached skull out in the middle of the desert. But I would argue that is not what xeriscaping is. It's not just gravel front yards full of just granite stone and limestone rock and no plants at all. It can be lush, it can be plentiful, it can be wild and woolly if you wanted. It can be neat and manicured. Um, xeriscaping is really just a series of seven principles, which we're going to cover today. These are core principles for horticulturists. If you're gardening, if you're landscaping, it is these core things that help you create a more efficient garden that utilizes natural resources appropriately. They can give you a more vibrant and interesting garden that responds more to your local identity and environment than necessarily having the exact same landscaping that they have in Vermont as they do down in Georgia, as they do over in Washington, as they do here in Illinois. So we can have a unique identity with this even. And so we're going to cover these seven core horticultural principles that make up xeriscaping. The first one, planning and design. So my background is in landscape horticulture and landscape architecture. So I love putting some, uh, some ink on the paper and planning things out, I think is very, very important, especially when you're starting out at the very beginning or whether you're right in the middle or if you have a well-established landscape, but hey, it's still awesome to draw it out and then change things around on paper before you get the chainsaw out and start changing things out in the actual landscape. So the first thing that I always recommend to folks is to take inventory of what you have. This is the first step in determining the existing site features on your property. Uh, it's going to be existing trees. It's going to be building footprints. It's going to be like sidewalks and driveways. You're gonna look at utilities. You're gonna look at all of the things that make up that landscape. That's the inventory, all these physical properties of your landscape. Now, there is also other items which maybe not be so apparent and this is, uh, forces you or allows you to analyze the landscape to determine, okay, so maybe the street noise is coming up from the south, we're getting summer breezes coming up from the southwest, winter winds are coming from the northwest, and so you can look at shade patterns, you can look at sun patterns, um, you can look where is the house getting the most sun exposure, and where is the landscape really, really heating up in the summer where water might become a big issue. These are all things to consider. And after you've inventoried and you've analyzed your site, it's to be, you begin to come up with, well, what do you want? Uh, you want to program your site very much like a computer programmer takes all these little components and they put them all together to create a computer piece of software. Now, what functions do you want your landscape to accomplish? Do you want to entertain guests? Do you want to have a vegetable garden? Do you want to have a space for kids, grandkids to play? Uh, these are all things to consider. And it's really only limited, I would say, by one thing. Money. Yes. Um, making sure that your program that you have for your site is within the scope of your budget. Would I love to have an Olympic size swimming pool? Sure would. Uh, it's going to be more than I can afford to install it and more than I want to afford to in terms of maintenance of that thing. So um, think about budget here as well. It's always a consideration. Now, as we're determining the use areas for our site, we all know um, we practice what I like to call mullet landscaping. 
Um, now this means you are all business in the front and you party in the back. So nice public area up front. And you know, the front of our house, we want to have good curb appeal. We kind of want it to tie into our neighbor's homes to kind of make it, give it that like park like uh, a feel of our neighborhood. So we're really, really, you know, paying a lot of attention to that front yard area. Now in the backyard though, that's the private spot. That's where the patio is, it's the grill, it's the pergola. We got uh, some vegetable garden. Maybe we got our compost back there. Uh, and then we have our service area. Maybe it's uh, where the trash can goes or that's where we take the grill when we're not using it. And this is usually area screened off from both the public and the private area. So you're basically drawing big circles around your house, trying to figure out how things are gonna fit and lay out. And we start looking for strategies to conserve water. Now, shade trees are an excellent strategy to do this. And I know maybe sometimes that might be counterintuitive because shade trees can also use a lot of water. Um, however, they can limit and reduce a lot of the irrigation needs around your home. A mature shade tree can actually create a landscape that is 20 degrees cooler than one that is in full sun. Um, when they look at something like a large mature oak, it has the same uh, uh, power to dissipate heat as four central air conditioners running 24 hours a day. So, I mean, that's a lot of cooling power. So that's pretty impressive. So shade trees are very important in helping us to manage our water consumption. Um, also, we can reduce or limit the amount of hardscape. Um, now, pictured here in the middle of there is one of those patios where they have like turf grass or thyme or some type of steppable uh, plant there growing in between. And, and I've never really seen those survive for very long. It often starts to look pretty rough and haggard over time. Um, it takes a lot of extra care, but maybe you don't need to have a massive uh, patio footprint out into the uh, the backyard. Maybe you can minimize that to allow a little bit more of that water to infiltrate. And when you have more water infiltration, when you have less hardscaping, that's less sun, sunlight beaming onto that, that surface and re-radiating back as heat, which then of course uses water. Um, other things we can do, installing things like shade structures like this pergola on the right. Also pruning uh, our plants to help control air movement. Now where I'm located in West Central Illinois, it gets a little windy sometimes. And so a lot of folks invest in windbreaks to help minimize the drying effect of, of the wind and help protect structures and the like. Um, now, if I would move closer maybe into say the suburbs of a larger city, um, I would wanna be a little bit more cautious with our, uh, the way we manage our airflow because we don't wanna to get to a smaller backyard with like a privacy fence and then a dense hedge and then lots of trees. And suddenly instead of a, uh, instead of like, a, uh, like protecting ourselves from the wind, we're gasping for air because it's a stagnant backyard. And so, you know, pruning those shrubs so to maintain their natural shapes, you know, going in pruning from the bottom, if it's a multi-stem shrub or are pruning out, uh, you know, a third of the growth and, and leaving a little bit open promote that natural shape of that plant, promote some air movement through that plant. And as we start to determine where's our public use area, where's our private use area, we also start to draw bubbles of how we are gonna be laying out our plants and what plants are going to require the most water. Now, as I mentioned before, we practice that mullet landscaping. So more than likely, we're gonna use more water in the front yard than we are in the backyard because we want that front yard to look nice. So very often, we're gonna have three types of water use zones. We're gonna have our high water use zone. Now, this are areas that still receive regular watering. So yes, we're talking zero scaping and water conservation, but we're not cutting it out completely. So typically, high water use areas are often lawns in highly visible areas or highly maintained areas that are by an entryway or maybe right along the patio. We then have our moderate water use areas. Now, moderate water use areas only require supplemental water when plants, maybe they'll start to discolor, wilt, or show symptoms of moisture stress. And this is only during times when it starts to get really hot and dry. So that's our, our moderate water use areas. Our low water use areas, are only areas that receive natural rainfall, even during times of drought. 
Um, so these plants here, they're selected for their tolerance to withstand drought naturally. Um, they might reduce their plant functions or they'll go dormant. Um, you know, but, 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 big but, we always water plants to establish them. We have to first establish that root system in the very beginning before we can say, all right, you're on your own. So we start to denote what is our high, moderate, and low water use. And you can, you can mix and match and combine them in this image right here. You can see our high water use area is comprised primarily of that area um, flanking either side of that entryway. It is probably the foundation plant in that front lawn, but it is bounded or it is kind of uh, framed in by these low water use areas, probably shrub beds or something like that. And so what would that look like? Well, it might look something like this. Um, so you can see in the front yard again, we have that high water use area, we have that foundation planting, and we have that turf grass area that's going to require a little bit more water likely uh, just to keep appearances up. But it doesn't have to be the entire front yard. We can frame this area using shrub material, small trees to help uh, minimize the amount of water that's required. If we go into the backyard, yes, maybe in the patio area, we do have a turf area that's right off of there. Um, maybe that requires a little bit of supplemental watering, um, but that we might call that a moderate water use area because there's not really people walking by there all the time. There's only a few people that see that. And it's not necessary for a cool season lawn to keep that green all summer long. And that of course, is encompassed in an area of shrubs, perennials that are drought tolerant and that don't require uh, constant watering. Now this is kind of what like a conventional house would look like though. So we have our foundation plantings there along the front and then we have our turf grass there with the entire front yard. Uh, and then of course our turf in the back and then maybe there's a hedge or something back there. And we can see how much more space or square footage this dedicates to irrigation. You know, the entire front of this house is now requiring constant irrigation to keep that turf green and actively growing all summer long um, and for it to look good. And even if you don't have a dedicated irrigation system, I often see this in the middle of summer, I'll be driving to or from work. And there are people all over with, that have their sprinklers out just to keep their front lawn looking decent. Um, you know, maybe they forget about the back lawn, but they really are working on that front lawn all the time and using all that water. Sometimes, you know, um, having done landscaping and installed irrigation systems in the past, it kind of hurt my, my soul a little bit to know that we were taking water that we worked so hard to clean and make it potable only to, you know, send it through all the plumbing and everything and then dump it back onto the ground. So, um, again, responsible use of our drinking water is important. So we could break some of that high water use area up, still maintaining good appearances, good curb appeal, but we're framing that with some low water use areas, using shrubs, using evergreens, and using trees uh, to help uh, frame this front yard in, give us a good sight line into that front door, and but but still, you know, help you know, trying to chunk out some of that high water use turf grass area. Um, and then chunking out some of that backyard turf grass. And we'll talk about turf more on uh, here in just a little bit, but do we honestly need that entire backyard to be lawn? What else could we incorporate back there that might be a bit more functional for us? Those are all things to consider and everybody's needs are different. So I can't you know, sit in my house and while you're sitting in your house and say, this is what you should do. Um, I try not to should all over you. So just keep that in mind. Um, but see, there's, these are just recommendations and ways and how uh, and ways to think about how can we look at conserving water in our yard in our landscapes uh, to improve water access for everybody. All right, so we're planning the design. Uh, we've we've got that under our belt now. Soil, the second of the seven principles. Why do we amend our soils? Well. There are a lot of reasons why we amend our soils. Now, I will start off by saying this section here, Illinois has some of the best soils on the planet. Um, we are very, very lucky to be where we are and be growing where we are. Um, however, I myself have installed many a landscapes following the post-construction process of a home or commercial building. 
And the soil that's usually left behind from that is usually pretty lousy. Uh, oftentimes when developers come in and create a subdivision or a neighborhood, what they will do is they will strip off any plant material and topsoil and they'll sell that topsoil because soil is valuable. Um, they will often go in and do a lot of earthwork and mix in a lot of the subsoil. And what you're left with is a, a pretty lousy growing media for our plants after the homes are all built and the landscaper comes in the last, very last contractor that usually is invited to uh, come and make the place look uh, decent again. So why do we amend soil? Oftentimes because we have to help, help them recover from that post-construction process. Uh, if you live in an older established home, oftentimes we've used up a lot of that uh, soil organic matter or a lot of the soil nutrients or it's compacted. And so we do have to do some soil management here. Uh, and healthy soil equals healthy plants. And oftentimes, you know, folks will call and they'll say, oh, I have this heavy clay soil. Now, everyone might think everyone in Illinois has a heavy clay soil, but there are definitely spots, and I'm looking at you, Mason County, if anyone's on here from there, um, that has sandy soils. Oh yeah, sandy soils. It's uh, so sandy when you uh, put your shovel in the ground, it's like you're at the beach. But what organic matter can do is it can help improve either that heavy clay or that sandy soil structure. So heavy clay, it breaks up that structure, allows water to drain out. Sandy soil, it actually binds some of that soil together and allows it to hold more water. Now, organic matter is important because when we take a like a cubic uh, foot there, or when we kind of take up a sample of soil and we see that uh, it has about every 3% of organic matter, that every 3% is holding one gallon of water per cubic foot of soil. Now that is the reason why we have such good soil here in Illinois. That's why during the drought of 2012, our corn and beans weren't wilting uh, out in the summer heat because that organic matter, think of it like a water bank in the soil. So it holds onto that water and allows plant roots to access it when it needs it. Um, so compost can decrease our irrigation needs um, we can't overdo it with compost though, so it's always a good idea to do a soil test. And I would lose my job if, with extension if I didn't mention that. So here, here's that slide. You should conduct a soil test though because it helps determine any soil needs and if there's anywhere you should concentrate your efforts. Um, it's, it's far better to start from a soil test results than just, as I call it, guessing. I just got off the phone with someone just a little bit ago talking about putting lime on their lawn and I asked why do you want to do that and they said well the farmers do it and the neighbor down the road does it they said but does that mean you need to do it the only way you would know that is if you would do a soil test that way you're not wasting your time and you're not wasting your money on products that you don't even need um, so soil tests are very important um, how do we amend with organic matter uh, it, it it depends uh, it depends on how much organic matter you would be applying to the soil or in, usually in the form of compost. Uh, so you would apply anywhere from two to six inches of organic matter, and then you could till that into the soil a depth of six to eight inches. Um, now, I oftentimes don't necessarily do that. I might top dress a soil with organic matter because very often I have established plantings around there and tilling would just be too destructive. Um, one way to do that uh, for me would be dealing with mulch uh, specifically wood mulch, which we're going to talk about here in just a second. But hold on, we have to mention this about trees and other native plants. Now, I have seen in instances where uh, contracting companies have gone in, they have this lousy uh, post-construction soils and they amend it. It's so light and fluffy. It's the most ideal horticultural soil you can imagine. And they go and they plant uh, like uh, native rain garden plants or something, or they plant some like a small pollinator uh, native plant garden. And the plants do horrible. It's because the soil is too lush, it's too rich. Um, you know, we're growing native plants, we're not growing tomatoes necessarily. And so um, we have to make sure that we're paying attention to the soil needs of some of the plants that we select. And I am sure you have seen this image here on the right side of the screen of those, those roots of those prairie plants. And we're gonna cover that here in just a little bit. Um, but again, there's a substantial amount of that biomass uh, of those prairie plants underneath the ground. And so they're looking for a specific set of conditions, which we'll talk about. Also, when it comes to trees, now it was extension recommendation time after time 
that uh, this was uh, several years ago, that when you are installing trees and you got you you got clay soil or anything you want to be amending that planting hole but what does that do well it does the same thing as if i took my oldest son and instead of telling him he had to leave the house and go to school i put a refrigerator a microwave a tv uh you know xbox computer all that stuff if i put that all in his room why would he ever leave he wouldn't have to and so why would the roots leave that planting hole if they didn't have to? Why would they venture out of that lush, beautiful planting hole to venture into your lousy native soil? And so what happens is those roots often, they will, they will uh, become girdled, they will circle, and you'll wind up with girdling roots that might eventually choke off and strangle that tree. Uh, it also creates a, a drastic uh, interference of soil textures, which goes into like the physics of water and how it doesn't like the cross textures. And so you're actually creating a nice little bowl where you'll be um, uh, allowing water to just sit there and drown, potentially drown that tree. And it makes it harder for the roots to, to penetrate through those interfaces too. All right, irrigation. We're talking efficient irrigation. And of course, we're gonna go back to this image right here where we're looking at high, moderate and low water use areas. Now for the high water use areas, Yes, we're still going to be irrigating our turf grass. Now, in the past, there was often two options when it came to uh, irrigation heads or nozzles. Now, on the left side of the screen, we have what's called a spray nozzle. Uh, it provides that constant fan of water that goes out. Um, now, the nice thing about the spray nozzle is that it applies a lot of water very quickly, so you don't have to have your irrigation system on very long. Downside to that, though, is if that if you do have a, a heavy clay type soil, the heavy clay soil can't absorb that water fast enough and you get a lot of runoff associated with that irrigation head. Now, on the right side of the screen is actually what's called a rotor head. Now, that's the kind that sounds like the typewriter, the tick, 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 brrrr, um, and that applies water much more slowly. However, that means you have to have your irrigation system on longer. Also, when it comes to both of these, we lose a lot of water to evaporation. Um, now, how do we, we bridge or marry these two things so we can apply water fast enough, but not so fast that it just runs off? And so hopefully more irrigation systems are shifting to what's called a spray uh, rotor, which is just a combination of the two <laughs> names there. So very clever irrigation companies. Um, but what essentially what is happening here is that there are now these fingers or these uh, beams of water that are rotating or pivoting along here. So it, it, it is both a spray and a rotor. It delivers water a little bit more slowly that can be absorbed by a clay soil without getting all of that runoff. So you're hopefully not wasting as much water. And so it kind of tries to marry the best of those worlds there. Uh, and they're called again, just a spray rotor. But really where is the future when it comes to irrigation and planting beds? It's, it's in drip irrigation. Now, drip irrigation can use 30 to 50% less water than sprinklers, and it very, very much minimizes water loss to evaporation. It drives me crazy to be going by a house when it is, you know, 95 degrees out, 20 mile per hour winds, and they're watering at like two or three o'clock in the afternoon. Most of that water is evaporating before it ever hits the ground. Um, it's such a waste of water. And so drip irrigation can be that solution, mainly when we're talking planting beds or vegetable beds. Um, there's lots of different types of drip irrigation on the left side of the screen that is drip line. And so there are emitters actually embedded within that tubing. And so you could do bedding plants like annuals right there. You could do vegetables uh, just along the lines or in rows here. And then you could kick on your drip irrigation system and that water would spread out uh, in, into the soil. On the right side of the screen, there's are actually drip emitters where you would stake them out near like a shrub or a perennial uh, or even an annual or a vegetable. And it would just drip, drip, drip there at the base of the plant providing water. Um, and, and so there are many different ways. Now, I know a lot of folks can be intimidated by drip irrigation, but it is so easy these days. A lot of garden centers just sell the kit with everything you need. Um, it comes with the uh, pressure reducer. It comes with the backflow preventer. It comes with the appropriate, all the appropriate fittings. And 
the uh, the drip irrigation uh, the, it tends to not clog as badly as it did in the past. And so you have much better control um, of your watering and highly, highly recommend it. I use drip irrigation now in all my vegetable gardens at least, and I cannot go back. Um, and again, you can even use it for large trees. As you can see here, this is once again, a drip tube with the emitters that are spaced out within inside that line and water is just dripping out of there, kind of like a soaker hose. Now, I can't mention drip irrigation without just making sure I throw this in here. Backflow preventers are very important when it comes to drip irrigation because you can get what's called back siphoning in any type of irrigation system where it actually there's a reverse pressure in that system and we can actually suck water along with bacteria and fungi into our water lines. And since very often our irrigation systems are tied into our drinking water lines, we need to make sure that we are preventing anything from backing up into our our drinking water. So the backflow preventers are, are critical. And really the goal with irrigating in our zero escape garden is just its minimal use of water. So once again, I'm, I'm reiterating, I don't, I'm not telling folks to stop watering. I'm just saying, you, you know, water routinely, but really only in the high water use areas, making sure that we're keeping up appearances, keeping up that curb appeal, um, but, we're only supplementing, supplementing water in those moderate use areas really on an as needed basis. And hopefully once those plants get established in those moderate wa water use areas, a moderate can shift or transition to a more of a low water use area. Um, and if you don't have an in-ground irrigation system or if you don't like using it, but you feel like you need to water your lawn, don't worry about it um, if, if you don't wanna do it. Um, there's really no need to water a cool season uh, a long grass that uh, in the middle of the summer because it has this dormancy mechanism that allows it to uh, the, the, that it will essentially protect it from drying out and dying. And once it cools off, once the rains return in, in uh, you know a few weeks to a month, then that grass will green back up and it will be fine. However, however, there's always a but because nature always bats last. Um, during 2012, we came into the situation, at least in my neck of the woods, of the drought was so severe that even that dormancy mechanism for a lot of our plants was not enough to stave off uh, death from drought. So in that instance where we hadn't gotten rain in about a month and it was really, really hot, um, the idea was to start providing about a quarter inch to a half inch of water every two to four weeks respectively. So every two weeks, you could apply a quarter inch. Every four weeks, you do a half inch of water. The point of this was just to keep the crown of that grass plant alive. It wasn't to green it back up or to bounce it back into active growth. It was just to get some moisture down there, allow that crown to soak that up and so that it didn't totally dry off and die. And so those are those extreme drought scenarios. But I would often uh, argue with folks that you know, if you had to choose, if you had water restrictions and you had to choose between water in your lawn, water in your veggies or water in your trees, well, when it comes to investment, trees are the biggest investment that we have in our landscape. And as I mentioned before, they are a, a important tool in cooling our landscape in part of our water management strategy. Vegetables, hey, you can eat those. Uh, definitely would uh, in, investigate watering those uh, second to trees and then Turf grass, well, you know, I can buy seed next year and I can re-sow that lawn in a year. So I, I wouldn't worry about that. But how long does it take me to grow that 100-year-old that oak? That's right, 100 years. Speaking of plants, let's talk about appropriate plant selections. Now, we saw this picture earlier. Look at these massive root systems of our prairie plants. Um, the ability for our prairie plants to access soil resources compared to say Kentucky bluegrass, which is also pictured here. And if you're looking really hard for it, I will give you a hint, it's on the far left side of this chart. Uh, you can see the Kentucky bluegrass uh, root system goes down eh, a couple inches. Uh, meanwhile, compass plant goes down like you know 15 feet. So uh, big difference uh, in, in depth there for our root system. And now if you go to the opposite end of this graph, we also have buffalo grass. You can see that root system there goes down pretty substantially. Um, so the, the point of this though, is that our, a lot of our native 
Illinois tall grass prairie plants are very well adapted to swings of drought and flooding. So every, uh, every spring, summer, fall, and winter, of course, uh, we have precipitation patterns that we tend to know is going to happen. Uh, Trent Ford, the state climatologist says, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. And so we expect that in the spring and the fall months, it's gonna be cooler, but we're gonna get more rain. And then the summer months, it's gonna be hotter and we're gonna get less rain. And so we just expect that. And a lot of our prairie plants have adapted to those different changes in our annual weather patterns. So native plants are, are, are really a, a, a fine choice for a xeriscape plant palette. Um, it's a good place to start at least. I'm not, I'm not a native only kind of person, but it's definitely a good place to start. Uh, and, you know, but again, just because a plant is called native doesn't mean that it's going to be like maintenance free or headache free. Um, you know, sometimes I'd say a native plant in the wrong situation can definitely become a nightmare. Um, so just make sure that you research the needs of your natives, put the right plant in the right place, assessing your microclimates, soil moisture, the light requirements of that plant and the light that that space receives. Um, making sure that there's plenty of space also because some native plants like to ramble and roam. Now there are other, another category and I kind of like to lump native and what I call adapted plants together. So native slash adapted plants. So these might not be native plants, but they're adapted. And what does adapted mean? Well, it means that it is adapted to our climate, to our region without becoming invasive or noxious. And so um, an invasive, the term that I use is the legal term where it's the state of Illinois and the federal government, they have a list of invasive species. Um, so that, that's the term I use. I know a lot of people say, well, um, you know, bugleweed can be invasive or dandelion can be invasive. Well, I call them aggressive, uh, maybe not necessarily invasive. So those are the way I use those terms. Uh, so examples here would be some type of shorter growing uh, types of like creeping junipers. Uh, and so it, I think you will probably see this pop up uh, over and over here in these plant lists. These uh, junipers or juniperous plants, uh, which are all related to Eastern red cedar in some shape or form, you know, they, they are not everyone's favorite, but when it comes to evergreens that are native to Illinois, we don't have many options. And these guys do pretty well when it comes to dry weather conditions. Other options in terms of ornamental grasses for the reed, Japanese silver grass or zebra grass, um, uh, perennial fountain grass. Now there are instances where I've seen some of these ornamental grasses escaping out into other places. And so just be careful. There is a lot of really neat native cultivars coming out onto the market. We have our Shenandoah switchgrass. Um, we got a lot of neat, interesting little blue stem cultivars coming out onto the market. Uh, and, and of course, who could argue with prairie drop seed, uh, everyone's favorite. As we move up into the plant layers, uh, into the shrub layer, um, we look at, we could possibly do abelia. There's butterfly bush, which I know there could be some debate on that. Um, and there are some states where they don't like butterfly bush. In terms of where I'm located, uh, I don't see that escaping into natural areas. It dies back to the ground for me each year. Um, there's also just boxwood, common boxwood can be fairly drought tolerant in the right situation. Uh, witch hazel, we have some interesting native witch hazels in our, for the state of Illinois. Oak leaf hydrangea, which is more of a native to southern parts of the U.S., you know, creeping a little bit into southern Illinois, not really, but it is an, a nice native plant, which might not be hardy to folks all the way up in northern Illinois, but they, I do see them growing in places like up in Chicago, Land Morton Arboretum, where they're able to cultivate them, um, you know, and, and maybe a harsh winter might set them back a little bit. Sweet spire, and, and of course the junipers, uh, the viburnums. How many viburnums? I, I lost track uh, in woody plant ID. We do have some holly plants. Uh, this is more for you folks if you're in southern parts of the state. Um, spireas, and then we come to the, the yucca. Um, the yucca is very drought tolerant. Uh, you cannot uh, you know, argue that it, it survives quite the harsh inhospitable conditions, but I say yucca has the word yuck in it for a reason. So maybe a little bit of plant bias there, but 
Uh, it is definitely one of those that, hey, I like it in other people's yards, maybe not mine. Again, as we increase up into our plant layers and the small trees, uh, various types of shorter maples, hornbeam and redbud, uh, possum haw, which is actually a deciduous holly. As I love that thing. I saw that all over the place when I was down in Southern Illinois. It's actually, I, one of my favorite small trees. Um, it's deciduous, but it still retains its berries even after the leaves fall. So it's beautiful. Now, crepe myrtle, I got a star by this. Uh, you go down into the southern parts of the states and you're like, you see crepe myrtle everywhere, but you come up into Illinois and you're like, where is it? Um, well, actually, they're starting to sell it. And I have grown crepe myrtle actually in the Quincy, Illinois area for years and years. I would think we're going on 10 years now. Um, some of those polar vortexes knock it back down to the ground. But a winter like what we just had, that thing keeps all of its above ground growth. Now, also, I grew up in Quincy. When I grew up there, it was zone five. It has now been bumped up to a zone six. Um, so the warm winters there are warmer. Uh, and so probably similar effects that you're experiencing right now. Um, Osage orange, it's another uh, interesting native tree. Um, tulip poplar, uh, Liridendon tulipifer. Now, that, this is an interesting one because some folks don't like it because of its drought strategy. Now, tulip poplar, the way it operates is that when it encounters dry weather, in order to, to minimize water loss, it actually minimizes leaf surface. And so there's people that have tulip poplars in their yard that are raking leaves in the middle of a hot, dry summer, because that's just the tree's defense strategy for uh, conserving water. Um, other ones like sweet gum um, or even bald cypress. Now you might find these in uh, more of a, a natural area that is a bit more like a wetland or lowland area, but they do pretty decently when it comes to dry weather conditions. Um, many types of our oak trees, our bur oak, white oak, uh, and, and so the, those are all very important. Uh, we're seeing a lot more elms uh, like lace bark and the zalcopa come out onto the marketplace these days. These are hybrids, um, but they can be fairly drought tolerant. And when we look back to our perennials, again, you know, focusing primarily on those native plants, but there are other things like some of our daylilies, coral bells, uh, poker plant, red hot poker plant. Um, and then, you know, of course, our natives, the asters, butterfly weed, uh, baptisia. So there's lots of different ones. And oh my gosh, did he actually put goldenrod on here? I sure did. I sure did. I, had, I think I went a little goldenrod crazy last year. I bought all different types of goldenrod. Did you know that there's more than just Canada goldenrod out there? There's all different types from every situation that you might need from full sun to woodland, uh, uh, almost full shade type setting. And I, I think I bought them all. I think I planted them all. They're beautiful. They're awesome. Uh, not the Canada though. The Canada goldenrod is in my backyard, uh, but not by choice. But there are some really interesting options out there when it comes to cultivated varieties here of some of these native plants. But remember, these plants are not out there with their little Excel spreadsheets figuring out how much water they're going to use uh, this day and that day. They are not saving you water. You are saving water as the designer by siting that plant in the correct location and managing them appropriately. And one of those things that we use to manage them, which is actually our fifth principle, is mulch. So we can use all different types of mulch out there. Now, if I had to throw out what mulch do I use most often? Well, I use the free one, free stuff <laughs> most often, which is often arborist wood chips. Um, hey, if they'll drop it off at my house and I don't have to pay for it, that's, that's great. I'll even still pay them for it. Um, I really do like, uh, you know, like a shredded type or a chipped up wood mulch for use in my yard. Um, now, what's, what I really like about the arborist wood chips though is that their texture is a little bit more coarse which means that they don't knit together and they, they, they don't form a shell over time. They allow water and air to flow through that mulch layer down into the soil while still helping to insulate that soil and inhibiting weeds germination. So um, that's why I kind of like that coarser textured mulch. Um, I still do love like a shredded type mulch. However, I'm just aware that the shredded fibers, they will knit together, they'll form that shell and I got to cultivate it. Um, and then, you know, you cultivate it 
and you, uh, you know, you see all the fungal mats there underneath, which is pretty cool, in my opinion, to see those things. Uh, I, I've even gone as when I was doing landscaping and we would top dress clients uh, landscape beds with a fresh layer of mulch, you could actually take a shovel down uh, with those shredded mulch types and you could actually see the stratified layers of years after years of putting mulch on there. Uh, so if you don't cultivate it, that happens. They got to cultivate those shredded uh, mulch, uh, wood mulch. Now, fall leaves, you know, we're lucky enough to have uh, oftentimes available shade trees around us. So if we're going to utilize them for their shade, let's utilize their fall leaves and we can shred them up uh, and we can use them in our landscape beds. We could, you know, mulch them back into the lawn if that works. And so that is definitely an underutilized resource, I think, uh, oftentimes in the fall and right now, I see a lot of people burning leaves. I'm like, no, shred them up or compost them, do something else with them besides burn them. Um, now, when it comes to something like grass clippings, I don't see much redeeming value when it comes to grass clippings. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. If you treat your lawn with like an herbicide, you don't wanna be putting those around your, your broadleaf plants anyway. Um, oftentimes grass clippings, they, well, mine are at least full of weeds. Um, and so the, the weed seeds come along with that if I'm trying to put the mulch around say a tomato plant. And then um, grass clippings, most they're mostly water and once they dry out there's not much to them and so they they can mat down um, and they actually can create moldy type conditions too so I, I stay away from glass grass clippings uh, throw them in the compost pile if you need to um, you know we'll talk about um, gravel and things in here in just a second oftentimes folks will turn to newspaper or cardboard um, I would caution folks when it comes definitely to the cardboard stuff um, I've used it in the past and it definitely does work as say an underlayment underneath the mulch. However, cardboard is full of junk. There's all kinds of labels and tape and staples and all this stuff, which you need to take off of there before you put that into the landscape. Um, and because the cardboard over time will eventually decompose, but those plastic labels, they're not going away. They're going to work their way up to the surface and become a, a nuisance. And that tape is always going to be you know, slowly breaking down, you're going to be pulling that out of your mulch bed. So making sure you're cleaning up any cardboard and cardboard if it dries out can also become hydrophobic. And so it can't, it might not let water pass through it into the soil underneath of it. Um, so just, just be careful with cardboard. I do use newspaper though. Uh, don't go crazy. You know, don't put an entire Sunday edition under a, a, a square foot. Um, that's a little excessive there. Uh, landscape fabric as an underlayment, once again, the mulch, see this used quite a bit. I have installed a lot of landscape fabric in my former life, but I don't use it anymore. I think it's a pain in the neck and it doesn't work after about two years. Eventually weeds grow through it or they grow on top of it. And so not a fan of it. And eventually the pores in that clog up. And then plastic film. Um, in my neck of the woods, people are still putting just a film of plastic, like drop cloth on uh, underneath their mulch, and I don't understand that. There is no redeeming benefit to adding more plastic into our environment, so please try not to do that. Um, plastic is a just it is a, a barrier for oxygen, nutrients, water, all that stuff from reaching plant roots. So definitely not recommended. And the mulch it reduces the water and maintenance needs of our plants. So the water needs by insulating that soil. We want the water to move and pass through that mulch layer to the soil underneath. And that's why I think arborist wood chips work the best for that need, um, but also still insulating the soil underneath so that water doesn't immediately evaporate off. They also decompose and adds organic matter back to the soil. That's a good, those are win-win things. And it can help reduce our maintenance needs. Uh, so we're not always out there pulling weeds and watering and taking care of things. The mulch can help hold areas, uh, spots in the landscape. Now. I am biased to this because again, as a landscaper, I hauled enough uh, granite rock to make me never want to ever push a wheelbarrow full of that again. Um, however, from a horticultural standpoint, rock really doesn't add much to our plants or to our soil. It can make the site a little bit more inhospitable even by heating up during the day and holding a lot of that heat at nighttime, which again, uses more water in the plant. And then there is rubber mulch. Um, I, not much to say about this except for uh, a tire 
must be disposed of in a regulated landfill. That is EPA requirement. If it is not disposed of in a regulated landfill, it is considered hazardous waste. So shredding it up and putting it around our roses doesn't change that fact. So I would steer clear of the rubber. All right, just a couple tips for mulch. Um, we want to extend the mulch for our, our trees two to three times the canopy of that tree. And yes, I know that's easier said than done. Um, that would be impossible for most of the trees in my yard. Um, however, um, what that can do by at least maximizing the, the mulch ring as much as practical, I would say, would be uh, min minimizing that competition with turf grass. Um, a lot of folks think that the tree top and the tree roots are exact mirrors of each other, but I, that's not how it works. Instead of picturing like two exact mirrors of each other, I want you to picture in your mind when you think of a tree canopy and root system, I want you to think of a wine glass. A wine glass has that large rounded top and it's got that base that spreads out. That base is the root system and the top is the canopy. That's more akin to what you would find with those trees. So tree roots and turf grass roots, they tend to occupy the same uh, soil volume. So there's a lot of competition happening. Your mulch depth should be anywhere from two to four inches deep. I go a little bit deeper, especially when I am establishing new landscape beds. Um, and also I do not allow mulch or fabric or whatever it is being used there to touch any trunks or stems. And if you are using that shredded cypress mulch, you have to cultivate it at least once per year um, so it doesn't form that shell. Now, on to the turf grass. Now I teach turf grass. Uh, for master gardener training. I do a lot of turf classes. I like a nice, well-kept lawn, but I think, can we all agree that we have a little bit too much of it? Um, look at this aerial photograph right here. This is just, it's like houses bobbing up and down in a sea of turf grass. That is a lot of, lot of water use, especially if these homes are all in-ground irrigation systems. In a lot of suburbs, they do. And so, we have a lot, a lot of turf grass. I mean, I don't live in this house, but if I did, I feel like I would be obligated to have a soccer team living with me to take advantage of this beautiful turf grass. So, you know, what can we do? Well, instead of defining our, our, our houses with lawn, let's use our landscapes and our structures like our homes to define that turf space. It's a far more aesthetically pleasing method to utilize turf as that negative space in the landscape. Um, by negative, I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm saying that it's kind of that void where the shrub bed right here is more of that, uh, more of that busy texture color. We need that negative space in order for our mind to relax. Um, it's kind of that static or that fire or that water feature. It allows our brains to relax. And so we need it but we have way too much of it. We, let's define our lawn areas with our planting beds. We can shape spaces, we can use lawns as pathways, as ways to gain entry or, or access to a space. So um, just maybe preaching to the choir, but let us manage our lawn spaces because they are really kind of taking over. Now there is the idea of a no mow lawn and these are plots actually in the Champaign-Urbana area of different no mow type grasses, fine fescues I believe, um, that look is not for everyone. Um, there are definitely some issues with that. Uh, if I were to walk in here, without a doubt, I would get covered in no CMs and ticks and all kinds of stuff. And so they're just attracted to me. I don't know why, they just are. Um, and so there, there is that issue when it comes to sort of these more uh, rougher, woolier type uh, locations. Um, I like the texture. And I've utilized it in designs before. This is a rain garden that I designed and installed here using buffalo grass as the edging plant. I love this waving texture right here. It's beautiful. Um, and it works well uh, in these kind of contained and functional environments. But I don't know if I could do my entire yard in this. I need to have a little bit of turf grass space. Now pictured up here is actually in this, uh, this book here, what we're seeing um, kind of behind the photographer is actually more of a manicured lawn, which transitions into this fine fescue no mow lawn, which then transitions into more of a wild pollinator prairie space. And so we can utilize stuff like this to help transition from our, from our home to a manicured landscape to slowly building into that more wild 
native type prairie plantings or woodland areas. Now, and some people completely omit lawn altogether. So in this aerial photograph here, you can see at least this house here on the south side, look at those beautiful mow lines there. Um, you can see this from, from the aerial, but the house to the north of that, do you see any turf grass? No, I see plants. I see a zero escaped garden and landscape. Uh, these folks are handling their stormwater in, in efficient, uh, practical ways. There's no turf grass. They're using drought tolerant plants and uh, they're maintaining shade trees in an effort to help uh, either block winter winds where those evergreens are sited or for the deciduous trees to help shade the building some of the hottest times of the year. But then the deciduous trees lose their leaves in the winter and helps to actually warm the building uh, once those leaves are down. So that is one method. Uh, again, uh, you know, manicured lawns, minimize that space using our shrub beds, or we could have a no mow lawn, or we just forget about the lawn. We go with uh, plants. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm saying folks, we should buy more plants. I think every gardener here can get on board with that. Finally, the seventh principle, the thing that people don't often think about, maintenance making sure that we're taking care of these plants appropriately. Let's think about our lawns, one of our biggest energy and water hogs in our yard. When is the best time to rehab our cool season lawns? Well, I know a lot of us are chomping at the bit right now in the springtime to get out there with our lawns, but the best time for a lot of our lawn activity, at least for cool season lawns, is in the late summer through all the early fall months. Um, these are things like, you know, if you're gonna fertilize once a year, probably should be a later season fertilizer application as opposed to springtime. If you're gonna aerate, spring or fall works great. Top dressing, spring or fall works great. Um, so, but you know, overseeding, things like that works really well as a late summer application, uh, seeding. Uh, mowing, this is the mowing mantra. Memorize it, don't forget it. You mow high, mow often, and keep those blades sharp. That's all you gotta know. That's gonna take care of a lot of your uh, lawn woes right there. Now we mentioned this already about uh, appropriate pruning of our trees and shrubs, making sure that we're not creating stagnant backyards in our, in our landscapes that this still promotes airflow, but maybe buffers some of that more excessive drying types of winds. And also the weeds. So in a zero escape situation, water is a vital resource. And if we have a weed, a, and, and what is a weed? Well, it's a plant that we don't want growing there. Maybe you're looking at this dandelion saying, that's not a weed. And I would probably be inclined to agree with you in most parts of my yard. Very few parts do I actually care if I have dandelions growing there. Um, but if it's an area where I know it's going to be growing, say, right next to some of my vegetables, I know that they're going to be competing for water. And so I'm going to get rid of that weed right there. And so that is a situation where in a, a zero escape yard, competition over water is going to be a more fierce. So give the plants that you want the advantage by keeping the weeds at bay. And know when to identify when plants are water stressed. Now is the plant on the left, the hydrangea, is that water stressed? Well, actually a lot of like some of our shrubs will, will wilt when it gets hot outside, but they'll perk right back up as temperatures cool off in the evening. So you could dump water on this all day and it'll still keep wilting. But this little tree over here, I would say based upon the scorched leaves and the uh, uh, dormant grass all around it, it's probably a little too late for that tree. Uh, those three little milk jugs just aren't going to cut it. Have emergency uh, watering plan. Now, I would say a rain barrel is not going to supplement probably most of our landscape needs for water, but it's something to have in case things are dire. Um, you know, if you have a tomato plant and you want to keep this one tomato plant alive, you might be able to do that with a rain barrel. Um, probably won't be able to keep a whole garden running, though. There are other items such as a rainwater harvesting systems that, you know, folks, you can, you can have these designed and installed in your uh, yards and gardens that actually harvest rainwater off of surface areas and that you can use. It's not potable for the most part, but you can use it for watering things like landscaping plants and for watering like edibles where the water doesn't come near the edible portion of the plant. Um, and then there's gray water. Gray water is actually the water that comes from the sink from the shower from uh, the, the clothes washer it is not the stuff that comes from the toilet 
Uh, so gray water harvesting is kind of a thing in various states. However, in Illinois, according to our uh, kind of our universal plumbing code, gray water use is actually illegal unless you do have a local code that circumvents that, that uh, negates that. Um, so for at least, uh, I would say most of us in Illinois, we cannot use gray water um, unless you have a local code that changes those rules. So just real quick, about done here, it's been an hour. Uh, so I just wanna give you one last example here. So this is actually a zero escape garden that is in Edmond, Oklahoma, where as we know, it can get a bit dry and windy and hot. Um, so this is the landscape planting plan, but of course this is zero escaping. So we gotta think about water. So what are their water use zones? And so this is it, as you can expect, kind of the more the front and center stage area, more water use in the turf grass area, more water use. Um, and then a lot of the other areas, less water use. It's an example of that right here. Um, you know, they're using mulch, they're using shade trees, they'll shade the structure. Uh, they also have drip irrigation system running underneath that uh, mulch right there. Uh, they do have an irrigation system in that, in that turf. There's those irrigation boxes out there in that turf, those green boxes there. Um, they're using drought adapted plants though. So they're trying to uh, minimize their water use. And the important thing here is, is okay, if you're not necessarily, if you're not minimizing your water use, I, I at least want you to start thinking about it. Because I think it's an important thing that we need to think about. Um, how we use the water and how maybe we could save a little bit of extra water every year that we garden. Um, this is a garden that's maintained by uh, Oklahoma Master Gardeners, and this is them working right here. And uh, I know many people listening here are also uh, volunteers with Master Gardeners. And so, you know, something that maybe you could think about with your individual projects that you're working on. So with that, if you enjoy uh, either hearing me talk uh, or reading things that I write, um, I do with my colleagues, Ken Johnson and Katie Parker, we have a weekly blog that we put out and podcast. Uh, and so you can check those out. You can sign up for them. Uh, you can go to them. I think uh, this week I'll be writing about selecting turf grass and who, and Ken's doing the podcast this week. Who knows what he's going to talk about? I bet it'll be about bugs because he's a bug guy. Um, so with that, I want to thank you very much for your time and attention today. And if you got questions, throw them into that chat box.